Happy Saturday, everybody. Today's classic episode is the conclusion of our two-parter on Harriet Tubman, which we started last Saturday in honor of Juneteenth. This episode originally came out on June 15th, 2016, and it covers Harriet Tubman's service as a spy during the U.S. Civil War and her lifelong dedication to helping and caring for people who were less fortunate than she was, even when she was in need herself. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. We are picking up today where we left off in the life of Harriet Tubman. And last time we talked about her life while enslaved in Maryland and her work with the Underground Railroad. There's the parts of her life and work that people are generally most familiar with unless they have watched Drunk History, uh, thanks in part to a preponderance of children's books about her and the prevalence of the Underground Railroad and elementary school lessons about slavery in the United States. But there was a whole lot more to Harriet Tubman's life and work than her time as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Even during the years uh, between 1850 and 1860, while she was actively leading enslaved people from Maryland into Canada, She was also working with the movements for abolition and women's rights, and she traveled all over New England to this end. She was connected to abolitionist John Brown before his raid on Harper's Ferry, which was part of a failed plan to start a slave uprising in the months before the Civil War. And in Troy, New York, she helped prevent an escaped slave named Charles Nall from being captured by slave catchers uh, and being returned south by literally shielding him with her own body. Basically, she did a lot, and a lot of her work beyond the Underground Railroad is overlooked entirely besides that drunk history episode that I keep mentioning because it is quite funny. Uh, And that's what we're talking about today. We've talked in more detail about how the Civil War started in our podcasts on Robert Smalls, and there's some overlap in this story and that one. So if you've heard those podcasts, some of this information might ring a bell. Very long story, very, very short, as the balance of power in the United States government started to tip in favor of free states, slave states felt increasingly threatened. Many promised to secede if Abraham Lincoln were elected president, and he was, so they did. Senator William H. Seward, who actually had sold Harriet Tubman land in New York that was adjacent to his own property, was one of the legislators who introduced measures meant to try to appease the southern states in an effort to stop this secession crisis. These measures included the return of escaped slaves back south. When this happened, a lot of Tubman's friends started trying to get her to flee back to British North America, which would become Canada, from Albany, New York, where she had settled with her aging parents. Because Seward and Tubman knew one another, people were afraid that he might send her back to Maryland as a show of goodwill to the South for the sake of trying to hold the Union together. The idea that people would even think this really sheds some light on the links that, like, the this, the federal government slash the northern states were willing to go to try to keep the South from seceding. Like... The fact that that would even occur to people. Uh, she did not heed this advice, though, and in the end, Seward did not use her as a pawn. So we're including that mostly <laughs> because it's illustrative. And it's not entirely clear what she did for the first six months or so of the war. Her biographers actually disagree, and even with that disagreement in mind, there are still gaps left open where there's no information. But by October of 1861, she had started passing the Union information about how the war was affecting enslaved people, delivering her intelligence to Franklin Sanborn. Sanborn had been one of the Secret Six co-conspirators in John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry prior to the war. That fall, she also traveled to Boston to talk to John A. Andrew, who was the governor of Massachusetts, about how she might serve the Union in the war. He thought, given how long she had been undertaking secret missions into slave territory as part of the Underground Railroad and how staunchly opposed she was to slavery, that she might make a good Union spy. Once the Union captured the Sea Islands off the coast of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, the same islands that were so familiar to past podcast subject Robert Smalls, Tubman did indeed go there to serve. In early 1862, she was sent to Beaufort, South Carolina, and from there to Port Royal Island. 
Her cover was that she was there as part of a humanitarian mission arranged by Boston Societies for Abolition to try to provide clothing and other necessities to Port Royal Island's formerly enslaved population. And she did do some of this humanitarian work, as well as acting as a nurse to both soldiers and contraband. Contraband is the catch-all term for formerly enslaved people who made their way to Union-controlled territory. Her first months in Port Royal were difficult. A number of missionaries and other volunteers there died due to disease and extreme heat. General David Hunter had issued an order that all enslaved people in Union-held territory be declared free. But Abraham Lincoln had reversed that order, afraid it would provoke the South even further. And this reversal, of course, enraged both enslaved people and abolitionists. It's another example of Lengths to which the federal government was willing to go to appease the slave states. Uh, That could be a whole other podcast. Anyway, eventually, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued on January 1st of 1863, which freed the enslaved population in the states that were rebelling against the Union. Also in January, Colonel James Montgomery was authorized to recruit Black soldiers into military service and train them to be soldiers. Once those two things happened, Tubman started investing her pay into building a wash house so she could teach formerly enslaved women how to make a living for themselves. She invested most of the rest of her money into similar endeavors, and she gave up her privilege of military rations because she thought it was causing jealousy among the people she was working with. Instead, she made root beer, pies, and gingerbread in her off hours so she could sell them and earn her own keep. The presence of a Black fighting force played a role in Harriet Tubman's most famous action during her time as a Civil War spy, which was a raid up the Cumbie River in June of 1863. We know it's a little early, but that is a pretty exciting story. We want to keep it all together. So we're going to get to it after a brief word from a sponsor. By the summer of 1863, Harriet Tubman was definitely putting her Underground Railroad experience to use as a spy in addition to her humanitarian work. Earlier that year, she'd been issued $100 by the Department of the South, which she had used to create a spy network. Her spies were all contraband who had had experience as boat pilots or doing other work on the water. Tubman ran this network under the auspices of Colonel James Montgomery, who was also by that point commanding the newly created 2nd Regiment South Carolina Volunteer Infantry African Descent. That June, General Hunter wanted to plan a raid up the Cumbie River, which was home to a number of plantations. It's possible that the whole raid was Tubman's idea based on intelligence that she'd gathered from her network of spies. Exactly where this idea actually came from is hard to pin down, but the fact that Tubman played a critical role in it is absolutely undeniable, along with the fact that she told Hunter she'd only participate if Montgomery was in command. It also seems as though she and her spy network participated in other similar raids as well, but the Cumbie River Raid is definitely the most famous. The plan was to take a force up the Cumbie River, evading and disabling mines that had been laid there, and then raiding the rice and cotton plantations that lay along its length. They would take what they could carry, liberate the enslaved labor force, and then torch the rest of it. Apart from the obviously humanitarian success of liberating hundreds of people from slavery, this would also destroy a source of Confederate assets and wealth. Tubman and the eight or nine scouts that she employed together worked out the locations of all the mines that needed to be disabled and spread the word to the enslaved people on the plantations of what was about to happen. She and at least some of these scouts were aboard the lead boat when it set off up the river. Three gunships and about 300 black troops were involved as well. On June 1st, 1863, they started their journey up the river. They raided plantations in Culleton and Beaufort counties, liberating the enslaved people there, capturing what provisions they could, and destroying what they couldn't so that the Confederacy couldn't continue to use it. This whole thing happened with no injuries to Tubman, her spies, or the Union fighting force who also participated. Possibly because the people who owned and ran the plantations found the sudden appearance of the 2nd Regiment armed terrifying. Farther upriver, plantation owners fled in advance of the incoming raid. 
The raid captured about $15,000 worth of property and 840 slaves, according to a letter from a member of the Massachusetts 54th Colored Regiment, which was published in the New Bedford newspaper. According to a letter that Tubman dictated herself, there were 756 slaves who were liberated. It was this and other actions that wound up earning Tubman the nickname General, with newspapers even going so far as calling her the U.S. Army's first woman general, even though she didn't actually hold an official military rank. She is, however, the only woman known to have led a military operation like this during the Civil War. As a side note, uh, after this mission, Tubman wrote a letter to ask for money to buy a bloomer dress of sturdy material because she tripped on her own dress and tore it to shreds while trying to hurry, escaping slaves to the boats. A bloomer dress, as the name suggests, had billowy pants under a shorter skirt, so it would have been much more practical for running around. <laughs> that story really cracked me up. Like... <laughs> I need a better outfit. Yeah, that's, more... uh, that's one of the... One of the things that I IMD while I was researching was the story <laughs> about the bloomer dress. Uh, the Cumbie River Raid was the most dramatic moment in Harriet Tubman's Civil War service. I mean, a, a, a troop troops of uh, one of the first regiments for black soldiers making their way up the river and burning down plantations is by itself pretty dramatic. But uh, for about a year after it was over, she stayed in the Sea Islands. She maintained the spy network, acted as a nurse, and continued supporting herself with her baking and root beer. Following the raid, a big part of her work turned towards seeing to the welfare of the people that she had just liberated. While healthy adult men were mostly recruited into the army, many others were ill or injured, and none of them had what they needed in terms of basic necessities. So as Harriet continued her work as a nurse, she also developed a reputation of being particularly skilled with herbal remedies, including a treatment for dysentery during an outbreak in 1863 and 1864. We mentioned it in the previous episode, but we should point it out here again that a lot of this was probably folk traditions that had been passed down from her ancestors who had uh, learned them in Africa and then brought them. Her grandmother was uh, most likely a member of the Ashanti tribe. In early 1865, Harriet Tubman went on leave and left the Sea Islands to go north to try to visit her parents. Her leave wasn't originally planned to be very long. The goal had been to go back to the Sea Islands and continue to educate the freed population on how to make a living on their own. But she got sick while she was away, and the war was nearly over once she went south again. So she was still in the north when Lincoln won re-election and when the 13th Amendment was passed and abolished slavery. When she did go south again, rather than to Sea Island, she spent time working as a nurse in military hospitals in Virginia. In addition to this work in nursing, she observed abuses that were going on in some of the hospitals that she visited, and she reported this information back to officials in Washington. After the Civil War was over, Tubman and a number of her abolitionist and civil rights allies really struggled for years to try to get back pay for the time that she had spent working for the Union Army, as well as a veteran's pension. These attempts were really unsuccessful because she hadn't been enlisted, because women couldn't enlist. She wasn't viewed as a veteran, even though she spent all that time serving. Once the war was over, Tubman went back to Auburn, New York, and we're going to talk about her time there after we pause for a brief word from a sponsor. So going back to our tale, uh, while Harriet Tubman was on her way back to Auburn, New York after the Civil War, a train conductor tried to remove her from the train car that she was on. She was traveling on a government pass rather than a full price ticket, and the conductor, in addition to calling her a racial epithet, tried to forcibly remove her from the train. Tubman had been doing manual labor for most of her life. She was consequently very strong, and she resisted him powerfully. He called three men to assist him, and they threw her bodily into the baggage car. Her arm was injured in all of this, and it's unclear whether it was sprained or broken, but she wound up having to wear it in a sling for a long time afterward. She considered suing the railroad, especially because the injury meant that she couldn't work, but nothing ever came of it apart from abolitionist and civil rights circles using it to illustrate uh, discrimination on the railroad. 
Back in Auburn, Tubman started something that would be her focus for the rest of her life. And that was caring for people who, because of age, poverty, illness, or other circumstances, couldn't take care of themselves. Her home became a temporary lodging for people that she had guided to freedom as they returned back from Canada, hoping to make their way home. She typically had at least two or three people staying with her who were elderly, sick, or otherwise in need of care. She developed a reputation for never turning away anyone who needed her help, whether she could actually afford to help them or not. She also collected clothing and donations for schools for South Carolina's newly free population. Along with other members of her household, she tried to make a living through growing vegetables and fruit, raising chickens, bartering, and doing domestic work. One of her Sarah Hopkins Bradford biographies was actually a fundraising effort during this time. Donations from former abolitionists and civil rights reformers also helped to pay the bills, although she generally was extremely reluctant to ask for money for herself. She would, however, ask for money to help the people she was trying to help. In the years after the Civil War was over, the United States was struck with ongoing waves of racial violence. In one of these, John Tubman, Harriet's former husband, was shot and killed by a white man named Robert Vincent, who was found not guilty by an all-white jury. And that event took place in 1867. In 1869, Tubman remarried to a man named Nelson Davis at Central Presbyterian Church in Auburn. Davis had also liberated himself from slavery. He had served in the Civil War, and he had been boarding in her house for about three years. In 1873, Harriet Tubman and her brother, John Stewart, had an unfortunate run-in with a couple of con men. They claimed to have $5,000 worth of gold, which they were going to sell Stewart for a mere $2,000. They framed it with a story that was tailor-made to play on Tubman's sensibilities. They said it was a trunk full of gold that an ex-slave had carried out of the South and wanted to sell to her because he needed money and he didn't trust white people. Stewart did not have that kind of money, and neither did his sister. But because of her work during the abolition movement and her reputation from the Underground Railroad, She was very well connected with some of Auburn's most affluent and influential citizens. Stewart looked to some of them for money, and a a few people tried to discourage him from this whole endeavor because they suspected correctly that it might be a scam. But a man named Anthony Scheimer advanced them $2,000 in cash, which the fraudsters said could only be delivered by Tubman to a secret location. When the time came, she went into the woods by herself and found the gold man, who claimed he had forgotten the key to the trunk. She waited there for him while he went to get it. And after he left, someone knocked her out, probably with chloroform, tied her up, gagged her, and stole the $2,000. She actually managed to get home again while she was still bound and gagged. Authorities briefly suspected that Tubman and Stewart were in cahoots with these con men, and Scheimer claimed that he had loaned the $2,000 with Tubman's house as collateral, so her home and the shelter she was affording to many other people were all at risk. In the end, though, Tubman and Stewart were cleared of all suspicion, with multiple prominent people in Auburn speaking up for her absolute unfailing integrity. In the 1870s, Tubman began attending the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church in Auburn, where her husband was elected as a church trustee. In 1875, Tubman's father died. Her mother died in 1880. Her husband, Nelson Davis, died of tuberculosis in 1888. By the late 1880s, Tubman was trying to turn her home-based care for other people into a more official charity, in part because most of the places that we'd call nursing homes today weren't open to Black people. So she wanted to start a, quote, home for aged and indigent Negroes, which she hoped to name John Brown Hall. To that end, she expanded the industries being done at her home to include a pig farm and a brickyard. She bid on neighboring land and buildings at auction, even though she didn't have the financing lined up to pay for it. Having successfully won the auction, she called on her network at church and in the community to scrape together a down payment and secure a mortgage. From here, she turned to public appearances and a new edition of her biography in the hope of funding the rest of the $1,450 that she needed. A lot of her speaking engagements were at meetings and rallies to promote women's suffrage, and she also spoke at the founding convention of the National Association of Colored Women, 
But even so, raising the money that she needed was extremely difficult, and she wound up needing to remortgage her own home in 1892. After speaking extensively at meetings and conventions for women's suffrage and the National Association of Colored Women, reissuing her biography, and continuing to try to fundraise for John Brown Hall, by the mid-1890s, Tubman realized she simply could not do it all on her own. She turned to both her friends from the abolition movement and friends from the AME Zion Church for help. Unfortunately, these two groups did not work well together, and they were sometimes at cross-purposes. Yeah, some of the biographers that look at this part of her life get into probably some implicit racial bias on the part of her friends from the abolition movement because there were definitely some cases where it was like her white abolitionist friends were making decisions uh, based on what they thought was best without actually consulting what was needed or, or what the people that they were trying to fundraise for actually wanted Over the years, the name and the purpose of this project shifted as well. It went from being John Brown Hall, which was a home for impoverished elderly people, particularly Black women, to the Harriet Tubman home, which was both a residence for the elderly and an industrial school to educate Black women to do domestic work. She actually felt kind of conflicted about this goal. There was a whole other debate going on at the time about what types of education the Black community would be best served by. Like, was it best to have vocational education so that people could learn to make a living for themselves outside of the, uh, like, the umbrella of slavery? And then, um, and then that would trickle down to, like, the next generations going to more academic colleges? Or was it better to give people a more academic education that would uh, basically expand everyone's social uh, standing and awareness. There's a whole big debate about it. Um, And then Harriet Tubman herself was kind of conflicted because she didn't actually like doing domestic work. She (laughs) had not been happy doing that when she was younger. She didn't totally get behind the idea of using her name to train Black women to do domestic work. But that's where it all ended up. In 1890, Harriet applied for a Civil War widow's pension, and she was finally granted one in the amount of $8 a month. She and some of her supporters once again renewed an effort to get a pension based on her own service. And ultimately, her widow's pension was raised to $20 a month in light of her work as a wartime nurse. She also received a small lump sum of about $500, and that payout happened in 1895. This wasn't a lot of money, though. And as we kept talking about, Harriet Tubman was more interested in helping other people than she was seeing to her own financial security. It's pretty clear from her actions. So she spent the last years of her life in poverty while still trying to see to the needs of people who were even less fortunate than she was. This sometimes drew the concerns of her old friends and allies from the abolitionist movement Uh, They were worried that she was being taken advantage of sometimes, and that worry actually was not entirely misplaced. In 1907, she was robbed of money she had been given as a Christmas gift, and that robbery was probably done by someone who had been living with her. On May 19th of 1911, she became ill enough to have to move into the Tubman home as a resident and be looked after by nurses. She died there on March 10th of 1913 at the age of roughly 93. In 2003, a payment of $11,750 was included in a Senate appropriations bill, basically as back pay for Harriet Tubman's wartime service, with the idea that it would go toward restoring historical sites that were associated with her life and work. Uh, And as was announced in April of 2016, which fostered a flurry of requests about her, she is slated to appear on a redesigned $20 bill in the U.S. On the back will be the White House and President Andrew Jackson, who is currently on the front of that bill. There are, of course, many other lifetime and posthumous uh, accolades granted to her and many things named after her, all kinds of stuff. But that's really the highlights of the life and work of Harriet Tubman who's pretty awesome. Like, a lot of people know the Underground Railroad part. People that watch Drunk History or have seen that video on the internet know the part about the Cumbie River raid. I don't feel like it's particularly well-known, especially maybe outside of Auburn, New York, that then once the war was over, she basically spent the rest of her life trying to take care of people, even though she did not have the money to take care of herself. 
She was basically yeah. like, I'm just, I'm going to take care of these old people who don't have anybody to look after them. I'm going to do whatever it takes to scrape up enough money to make that work. I have one question. What is it? Did she get the bloomer dress? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's a great question, though. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 